Vozdevac Stadium looks pretty normal until he realized it's on the roof of a shopping center. Open in 2013, fans of the Serbian Super League side Vozvodak can go and watch their local team play as well as get a bite to eat at McDonald's, look their best for the game by stopping at H&M and then going to the weekly shopping at one of the supermarkets. With a capacity of just over 5,000, the stadium is also fully up to UEFA for spec, meaning that if the club ever reach European football, Vozdevac will be able to use the stadium and its shopping centre to host European matches. Any F1 fan will recognise this section of a Singapore street circuit, as the cars race along a narrow straight before taking a 90 degree left-hander, much to the light of the onlooking fans. When the Formula 1 circus isn't in town though, this large seating area is used as a football stadium. The single stand can hold 27,000 spectators, whilst the float can hold the weight of 148 elephants. Originally built in 2007 as a temporary venue whilst the National Stadium was being rebuilt, the float has remained and hosted a number of large sporting events, such as the 2010 Youth Olympics and, of course, football. Although there were plans for the national team to play there, those plans sadly never came to fruition. I wonder if the ball boys get paid extra to dive into the bay to fish out any wayward shots. Igrilishte Bateria, and apologies to any Croatian viewers for my butchering of that pronunciation, is on this list because the pitch is located right between two UNESCO World Heritage Sites. On one side of the pitch you have Castel Camalengo, which has changed plenty over the centuries but its current form was shaped by the Venetians in around 1420, designed to defend the sea channel leading into the town's port. On the other side of the pitch is the Tower of St. Brand, which was a 15th century defensive building designed to defend from the attacking Turks and was originally connected to the Castle Camalengo by the city walls, which are now long gone. The stadium itself is home to regional Croatian side HNK Trogir, who no doubt must be subject to jokes weekly about making the ground a fortress. Located in South Africa, the Bantho Stadium is possibly the most unusual looking football stadium ever. Built in the 1980s, the stadium seating plan is bizarre. Spectators must sit on an angle that's not necessarily facing the pitch. The stadium has also been used for athletics, but even then that doesn't explain the odd facing stands as some spectators will be facing away from the 100 meter track. But it gets even weirder. The stadium seats 59,000 spectators in one of the poorest areas of South Africa. As a result, there has never been any real demand for the stadium to be used, with only the occasional match taking place there. And it gets even weirder again, because this isn't the only stadium like this. Odi Stadium in North Pretoria, with 60,000 seats, is South Africa's third biggest stadium. Although it has the same layout, it was actually used by Garankuwa United until 2008. Since then, it's fallen into disrepair and is no longer used. Estadio Municipal de Braga was built for the 2004 European Championships in Portugal. At first glance, it may look like a fairly ordinary 30,000 seater stadium, until you realize it only has two sides to it. Built into the side of a quarry, the stands were only built along the sides of the pitch to ensure the stadium fit into the natural landscape better. The stadium also has a giant area underneath the pitch for fans to buy food and drink before heading back to their seats. The stadium was used for two European Championship group stage games, with fans witnessing Denmark beat Bulgaria 2-0 and the Netherlands recording a 3-0 win over Latvia. Since then, it's been the home of Sporting Club de Braga, as well as playing host to a number of matches for the Portuguese national team. Thanks to France's Bourgeois, who's made train spotting more popular than ever, fans of locomotives may be familiar with Tatran Cyrene Stadium, that has an operational train track going between the pitch and the main stand. But it's not like the trains wait for the game to be finished. From time to time, a train will go along the tracks during the game, temporarily blocking the fans' view of the pitch. Unlike the question what came first, the chicken or the egg, we do have an answer here. The train track came first, with the local football team using the available land next to the track. As the town and team grew, fans needed somewhere to sit, and the other side of the train tracks was the only easy place to put them. Venice is more famous for its series of canals and rich trading history than its football team. But Venice is home to Italian Serie B side Venezia, and they do play on the floating city. The stadium is actually the second oldest stadium in continual use in Italy behind Genoa Stadium, who of course have been rivals of Venice for centuries. The reason the stadium makes this list though is that the easiest way for fans to get to the stadium is by boat, which is something no other stadium hosting professional football in the world can boast. I'd be interested to know though if a team bus is actually a team boat. From one of the lowest stadiums in the world right on sea level to the highest in Europe, Otmar Hitzfeld Stadium in Switzerland is 2,000 meters above sea level and requires two cable cars to get there. Because of the high altitude, the air is thinner than at sea level, which away teams often feel gives the home team a big advantage. Because of the constraint to the landscape, the pitch is smaller than a full-size one, meaning it can only play host to eight-a-side matches. 
However, the locals do come out in big support for amateur matches, with a few hundred turning up to see their team. But if you think that stadium is high, wait for the next one. Estadio Hernando Siles is Bolivia's largest stadium and is situated in the capital, La Paz, at a mere 3,637 meters above sea level. The most bonkers part about this stadium is that for people who aren't accustomed to high altitudes and spend most of their time around sea level, altitude sickness will start to take effect at around 2,500 meters, or a mere 1,137 meters below where the stadium is located. Lionel Messi might be the most famous person to succumb to altitude sickness in the stadium, vomiting on the pitch in 2013. Until May 2007, the stadium was allowed to be used in FIFA World Cup qualifying, despite protests from other nations. However, in May 2007, FIFA put a ban on World Cup qualifying matches taking place at an altitude of over 2,500 meters. However, there was a lot of backlash against this ban, as other stadiums, especially in Latin America, would be affected. So in June 2007, FIFA raised the limit to 3,000 meters and gave a special exemption to Estadio Hernando Celes. The high altitude and home advantage clearly helps though. From 2006 up to 2018, Bolivia recorded 14 home wins during World Cup qualifying matches, and just the zero away wins. And finally, a little closer to home. Stadiums up and down England come in all shapes and sizes, ranging from just a little brick lean-to to shelter under, up to the most impressive new stadiums like Tottenham's new home. But the weirdest for me is the Kassam Stadium, home to Oxford United. Completed in 2001 and named after the club's then owner, Firoz Kassam, the stadium only has three stands. During the stadium's construction, Oxford fell on hard times, suffering relegations and financial problems. This resulted in the stadium's construction being scaled back to just three stands to keep costs down. One of the main downsides to this is that the stadium acts as a funnel for the wind and is known by some as the coldest stadium in the UK. And to make matters worse for Oxford, the club don't actually own the stadium. It's still in the ownership of Feroz Kassam, who sold the club in 2006. Their lease on the stadium ends in 2026, and there are currently plans drawn up for Oxford to build a new stadium with stands on all four sides of the pitch.